Thank you for staying this Saturday afternoon. Uh, um, so I'm trying to overview uh, Raman spectroscopy in uh, superconductors and then we uh, give uh, some of the storage perspective and then a little bit of everything. Uh, not too much nick tiles because the Raman and nick I believe is still very controversial. Uh, uh, but I will try to uh, put a technique on his, its legs because historically there was a time that there were many Raman groups doing, uh, looking for effects in superconductors and somehow I think we lost the competition to infrared, to NMR, to Neutron scatter is to ARPES, to tunneling. So there's only a few groups on, on the globe now that are pursuing that field. So I will try to try to make the case here. Um, now, historically, the very first measurements of superconductor was done in Urbana by uh, Surya Kumar, uh, who was a student of Miles Klein. And this is the very first publication, it's dated 1980. Except there was a report in late 50s from Moscow State University that I think never was translated in English, where in type one superconductor, people did see some little bit of suppression at low energy in spectral wave. I believe it was Niobe that uh, was, was wrote. So this was a very interesting system because this is actually a competition of charge density wave and superconductivity. Uh, it took a full PhD that was not four or five years PhD, much longer PhD for Suri Kumar to obtain this data point. So there's a lot of credit to this one. Uh, and yeah, it's done on Niobium-Dysalanite, it's easily cleavable system. It goes through sharp density wave transition that's very visible in, in resistivity, and then there is a superconductivity at, at lower temperature. <laughs> now, on the serving side, uh, we can show BCS, and uh, BCS gives credit to optics, to uh, income scope. Uh, Raman is not mentioned in BCS uh, The very first discussion, theoretical discussion of uh, electronic Raman scattering in superconductors is going back to 1961. That was a PhD work of Berlin Falkowski, who worked with Dr. Kosov. And uh, they obtain basically correct, correct result except, except the screening effects were not included. And that gave uh, an error by about five orders of magnitude in observables. Uh, and that was corrected about a decade later in a course of getting. So the motivation for this work was this observation that was done in Moscow State. But so this, this probably is the first uh, first uh, theoretical report, or at least proposal, that uh, Raman scattering might be useful for superconductors. Now, so what what is actually done? If you have a simple circular spherical therapy surface in optical conductivity, the coupling is called the perturbator, the vertex, and what we couple is to uh, velocity. <laughs> Uh, in Raman scattering, uh, this is complementary approach. So the coupling is to density density. So the vertex, the coupling vertex, is effective effective mass tensor or stress tensor. So the excitations that are looked at, it's not just shift of Fermi surface in one direction, like it's in conventional method, but, but this kind of um, there was a question. Um, okay, now 
if you go to now very basics of the superconductivity. So the superconductivity can be described by its order parameter. The order parameter has an amplitude and phase. Uh, in a neutral condensate, the phase is the constant mode, has no energy. Uh, in charged condensates in superconductors, due to other scientists, um, this gets pushed out to fairly high energies. So the Bagalub of Anderson collective mode is, is way up on electron volts. Uh, but there is also this amplitude mode, so oscillations of this parameter delta can be excited and makes it happen. It would be the distinct real thing. Uh, and it was argued in the very first uh, theoretical report after this very first experimental work came out uh, that what observed, what, what Klein and Surit Kumar saw in the very first spectra is actually an amplitude mode of charge density wave that couples to an amplitude mode of superconductor. And the new feature that was seen below the superconducting transition is this feature that is not about about 7.2 degrees it goes away and it appears from here uh, is actually an amplitude mode of the superconductor and later Peter Hicks said that this is the observation of Higgs boson and it was a big, big uh, deal and big statement of that um, I don't think that's actually the case and maybe I will have time at the end of the talk uh, discuss uh, the controversy of that interpretation, but but that was historically the first. Now, in the superconductors, of course, there is an entire zoo of collective modes. So <coughs> this is the phase that is not a Boston mode anymore, but but in dirty superconductors, there is a Boston golden mode that can be close to Boston mode. There is in multibands that we should discuss at this conference. This legged mode and similar modes, they are almost Boston modes, they're low energy phase modes. Then there's an entire zoo of so called Bardassi Schrieffer modes, and this happens that there are several competing uh, channels in different symmetry channels for superconductivity to occur, for instance. There is a D wave in two heads that is the winning, but there is a first loser S wave, and the other other channels possible interactions. The S wave will be due to phonons, for instance. And spectroscopically, it's possible to observe these modes. There are real modes in the gap, and you can do excitations from the D wave ground state in the excited state. Well, in this case, it's the collective mode in the gap. Now, all these collective modes are not, it's impossible to see, you can't see them in one particle spectroscopy. So ARPES or STM would not directly couple to that. They do contribute to some energy effects. Certainly, uh, they modify the density of state. And as a result of that, uh, there were questions earlier in the week about, for instance, if Penetration depths can be modeled by uh, some of Arrhenius, Arrhenius behaviors, and the answer is no if the interaction between, between the bands is included because that severely modifies, modifies the stuff. So, all right. Now, I want to move on from 1980 to 1984. So, uh, Peter showed the VCS paper, optics was mentioned there, Raman was not. Uh, what was mentioned is a, a discussion of NMI result and Hubert Slichter P. So in the context of coherence factors, and that is very important in understanding of Raman scattering, it's also important in understanding in elastic Newton scattering, so the coherence factors come in the game. But this, is, uh, this was the first 
com comprehensive paper that, well, I regard as this missing chapter of BCS. It's a long, long article that goes through all the details of light scattering, electronic light scattering. So it uh, it's, was written by Steve Dirker and Miles Klein. Steve Dirker is well known these days, he's director of SNLS. Uh, and uh, if I just try to do the, the simplest, simplest analysis of what was said is, is the following. So in the normal state, uh, if you have a simple band crossing Fermi edge, the Raman scattering all it can excite at excitation very close to zero energy. And this is because the photons are very light and there is a conservation of momentum. And the, if we do back scattering, so if I scatter light back from my sample, the only momentum I can give to the system, quasi momentum, is twice the photon momentum. That is tiny, and that's this magnitude. So the excitation, the maximum excitation is so-called QV Fermi, and all that can be excited is, is this triangle with a cutoff that is determined by the Fermi and well, the color of the light. So it's determined by velocity of the speed of light. Uh, so this, this is what we have in normal state. Now, the story and about well, those excitation size, as I said, it's, it's a density-to-density uh, correlation, basically. You change the density around the surface. Now, what happens in the superconducting state, however, the gap opens up around the surface. And that leads to possibility of, so this is our condensate. And the excitation in the superconductor conducting state is excitation of two quasi particles out of that condenser. So we excite two quasi particles out of that condenser. And that leads to a peak uh, that was first observed, well, more or less simultaneously in Urbana and uh, by Rudy Huffel in Munich. And uh, that leads to a peak so-called coherence peak in s superconductor. The coherence peak is at energy of 2 delta. So we expect no excitation below that. This spectral weight is not a transfer. There is no <coughs> some rules here. This comes from nowhere. And if 2 delta is much larger than QV Fermi, it is way out here, we get a very strong and healthy square of singularity high excitation. If it's in the midst of QV Fermi, all we get is a, basically a cutoff of low energy part if 2 delta would be here, we would cut it in here and we will not have any coherence peak here. And that was, well, and then of course in the gap we can have uh, collective modes and by doing symmetry analysis we can learn a lot about, about these guys and they can tell about the interaction. So it's captured in again in the same paper that if, if the 2 delta is much larger than QV Fermi, then what's seen is the square of singularity, and this is, this is the 2 delta. But if we are in the limit where 2 delta is weak, typically type, type 1 superconductors, then all it's seen in this QV Fermi scene, this gets eaten away and there's no other effects. So, and this is so far all for one band superconductor. Maybe an example, an example of that, this is now still two band superconductor, is calcium C6. So it has been discussed a lot at this conference. Those are the K points, K prime, K point. Intercalated graphite, uh, heavily doped, so this, those would be the graph points, but they are not in the ground because they are doped all the way by several, to several electron volts by uh, putting calcium in between. Uh, there is a heavy charge transfer from calcium band to, to this graph graphene band. Uh, and it's uh, about 11 or 12 degrees superconductor. And if we do Raman scattering, we look temperature dependence on that. So in the normal state, 
above dc, dc this continuum, this is the QD Fermi continuum, and then by lowering the temperature, what, what we start getting is it's a coherent peak. In this case, we see two features added together, there is a coherent peak, and there is this cutoff, the coherent peak is coming from um, uh, the coherent peak is coming from uh, this band, the carbon bands, uh, still the up points, and this is a three-dimensional band that has a huge QV Fermi and just just this gets speed enough. But this is the coherent peak, and basically in quasi-particle, in simple quasi-particle particle picture, the integral under this peak tells us about the density of the group. So that can be the Fermi from, from Raman's spectroscopy test. Now, uh, because uh, Raman scattering is a two photon flow, the response function is a tensor, and uh, there are all kinds of symmetry gains that can be played with the system, uh, especially if the sample has high symmetry. For instance, for the Dragonov systems, like who plates are, we can, by sending the light and collecting the light uh, differently in respect to the crystallographic axis, we can choose the symmetry of the excitation. We, look, we do spectroscopy, what's called. And we can play against the way that excitation is x squared, y squared. Like, that means that it has to change sign allowed along these lines. So those nodes are public nodes here. And if you do excitation in this, we know that we are not probing Fermi surface in these points. We just don't couple to that. But by logic, we couple presumably more here. So those are the points that we are probing. So if we incorporate on this Fermi surface, if we do light scattering, we learn about what happens here. Uh, we can rotate that. Uh, polarization of light and get to a system that the nodes are this way so we don't couple to uh, this point at all and we mainly couple to this by half by half regions and then we learn more about that and by doing that we can learn that what the maximum gap value is it's, it's zero pi uh, we almost don't couple to these points here. Now, unlike in the example of, I showed for calcium C6, that is an s wave superconductor, uh, where there was a sharp cutoff for excitation. Here, there is a long tail going down to zero frequency, and this is because the gap is vanishing, and there is a basically zero gap along the node lines, but those nodes are in this geometry aligned along, along the uh, deep wave gaps. And in this geometry, they are rotated. So uh, we are not picking up intensity from this point. So that's why the gap is large. We lost almost the entire spectral wave. But we still see the gap in the gap for the minimum. That's the maximum value of gap for the minimum. And so this tail tells that they are not. Now, uh, uh, of course, uh, well, for high DC, uh, over 20 years, a lot of data was collected of this kind. This functional doping is one example of it. And so far, what I was telling you is a simple quasi-particle picture, non-interactive picture, where one would believe that this magnitude of the heat seen here is consistent with twice the value of the gap measured by one electron spectroscopy. So if I do RPS or SDM, I measure delta, I do Raman and I expect it, let's say, at twice that length. And well, that is the case in, well, in case of high DC at high dobit. So the red points are Raman data taken from uh, different groups, not only not only us, uh, these green points are data from one electron spectroscopy, and they are aligned in the overlooked 
part, you know, that in other note part, the claim is that the gap is, is growing to something like 8 KTC, 10 KTC, 12 KTC, various reports. But in Raman, for instance, the peak is not going, it's not following that, it remains here and it remains below twice the gap. And this is because now the correlation effects uh, finite state interaction become important and this actually what seen here is a collective mode and well that's the first example I want to bring of importance in. so it turns out that this mode in this symmetry channel the position of this mode depends on the nature of the pairing group, the nature of pairing interaction it's shown in this paper that if the coupling is in cha-cha or in basically phononic channel, this mode will be pushed in the continuum and we shouldn't see. And on opposite to that, if the coupling is in magnetic channel, then the energy should be lowered and we should see them. So uh, one can take this data as a proof that the coupling in high DC, well at least in BISCO, uh, is due to, due to some kind of magnetic interaction. So the boson has magnetic origin. Uh, now we can go to uh, other side of phase diagram, electron doped materials. And what happens there is undoped materials as we now have only only electron type pockets. Uh, as we do the material, a whole type pocket appear here. And the superconductivity really appears only when the whole, whole type pockets come up. So there are two bands in the system. One is around 5 zero, that's the electron band. Another one is here. And this is for the old system. So for unload system, there is only, the gap is larger, there is only crossing here, and this point is under the, under the water, it's under the sea. So naive cartoon is this, so it's, uh, it's, if we start from this LDA type banding band, and introduce SDW, we will have upper and lower cover band, and when we start doping the material, the gap between, as the W gap between these two band collapses, like this, right? And now if we cut it with the 30 surface, the cut really depends on, on uh, how big is the gap. So in this case, there is no, that only the electron pockets are seen, and then at some doping, we get the whole pockets. It turns out that when we get the whole pockets, the superconductivity occurs. So there's no superconductivity here. The superconductivity starts where there is a small pocket of itself at like half by half. And then it grows and eventually becomes one back. Uh, and that can be directly seen from Raman scattering, uh, where we can separate the contribution of that whole pocket and the electron pocket, and indeed uh, in very underdoped material that we see is low. There is almost no contribution from electron pocket, and there is this pair breaking excitation that well, the integral under that can tell us something about the Cooper pair density. Now they live here, and we can see that when when these pockets grow, uh, we get a very healthy peak here. It's divided by 2, it doesn't fit in the scale, this is 25, so it's all the way to 50, and this is the strongest feature there, so really the superconductivity in so-called electron dope compounds live on this whole pocket, so they're, they're actually whole, whole type super. Uh, and of course, as a function of phase diagram, the gap, the gap magnitude can be measured, uh, measurements can be done in field. From field measurements, 
uh, how the critical feed can be extracted, uh, coherence lengths, and everything else. And so a lot of things can be done when on stairs. Okay, now I want to go to, I want to switch to really multiband effect. So everything I was telling you historically, uh, the multiband effects they ignored. And this is kind of the second part, very recent, second part of this missing BCS chapter that was now published, especially emphasizing the multiband effects. Uh, and those are very subtle effects. Uh, I want to do it by example of MGB2. This is the first system where two band physics was truly recognized. Uh, there are two bands in MGB2, so called sigma bands, that are two dimensional uh, cylindrical Fermi surfaces give, give rise, and then so the pi bands that give, give rise to these tubular Fermi surfaces. And it turned out to be. Uh, uh, BCS type phononic superconductor, the coupling is mainly to this, this phonon, this phonon, phonon stretching EG mode. Now this, if we do run spectroscopy, this is the phonon, this is the normal state data in E to G channel. There is some continuum, this is a semi log plot just to cover a lot of space. Uh, this is a peak to the forum. And uh, in the other channel, this is a boring two forum scattering features. So this is the important model that we rise to superconductivity. Uh, when we cool the sample down below superconducting transition, what we see? We see a suppression below some threshold energy in all scattering channel that tells that this is a fundamental gap or small gap. And then what we see else is this peak, and this is a coherent peak. Intensity for that comes from nowhere. And well, I will argue that this is the large gap in the, in the system. Besides, what else we see? We see this corner. And uh, this is now the same data in linear scale. So this is the corner. This is the coherent peak, large gap. To delta, this is the fundamental gap. If I stay in the sa at the same temperature in uh, low temperature if in the superconducting state and apply field above the critical value, what happens is I basically kill all the superconducting features, the coherence features of it, and what I see is also there is a shift, visible shift of that corner. Now this phonon is very, very broad, it's very unharmonic, and that most likely is the reason why the MGB2 uh, is superconductive. It's very unusual, it's very strongly coupling to, to, the, con to the continuum. Typically phonons are very small <coughs> features in the atmosphere. This is very broad. AC2 is common, uh, ah? oh, AC2 is common, or you can uh, use uh, magnetic field which suppress get in one band and, uh, uh, of course, everything is common because, as I will argue, there is a tunnel in between the bands. There is a joke. Yeah, but there. to the extent that uh, these are really two independent uh, gaps. Uh, yeah, but they are, they are linked together. I'll, I'll get to that in future slides. Do you see a shift in the phonon frequency as you go through TC? Good, good question. So, uh, this is... This is... Uh, Frequency of this phonon as function of temperature. If I turn on the field, I will see this, what I expect for unharmonic, unharmonic decay. If I do it without field, when I enter in the superconducting state, I see the hardening of this model. Right? And this is direct, direct signature of the coupling. It's actually a smoking gun, so I can from that calculate strengths of the electron form to this particular. So that's a useful technique. 
Uh, what else can I do? I can, I can watch what happens with this peak as a function of temperature, so I'm cooling down, see this peak is collapsing, and then the normal state is gone, and I can plot to delta versus peak. And it's easy as a well time. And this is, this is the fundamental gap, a small gap, for instance, if I apply field, I fill the gap in a normal state. So, now, why the signatures are so different? Here we have a coherent peak, and here we have uh, just a cutoff. This comes from this three-dimensional system. There is a lot of QB Fermi, and we are in the limit where this two delta is smaller than QB Fermi. Remember in the beginning, I showed that two distinct limits. So for this gap, the QB Fermi for this band, the QB Fermi is smaller than 2 delta, and we see this coherence, like in calcium C6. So then those are two different questions. OK, so by doing this uh, exercise, we can measure the gap on, on both Fermi surfaces. But that's not close. So the most interesting part of that, that this is normal state, and this is superconducting state. And what we observe, that was initially very puzzling, we have the future that is in between. It's a different symmetric channels of full symmetric excitation. In one band system, this is typically screened. Uh, in early work, that screening was missed by the course of Genkin, never Falkowski. Genkin corrected that. And in one band metals, this intensity in this channel should be five orders of magnitude smaller than anything, anything because cooler is cooler is scaling the rest. Is that why there's no two delta peak? That's not the case anymore. Yes. Sorry, is that why there's no two delta peak? Is that the screen? In the A1G? No, no, in, in multiband, that's, that doesn't apply, because especially if you have coal and electron, though, that so, there's a compensation. So, yeah, why, so why don't you see any two delta peaks in A1G? Uh, I answer that question in two transparencies. Okay. That's a good question. Yes. Uh, the reason is the reason is here. And what is this? So to get to that, we should remember that we have two order parameters. So we have our order parameter sitting on sigma band, and we have an order parameter sitting on pi band. Each of them has a phase. Uh, if there is no interaction between sigma and pi band, Phase is completely up. The system doesn't now, they are uncoupled, they don't know about each other. So, however, if there is a coupling, and this is, this is the case where there's no coupling, and we can, uh, this is the lower gap, this is, this is the higher gap, and they can be directed as they wish. However, if there is a coupling turned on, depending on the sign of this coupling, uh, they store the parameters still anti align So that, that means that we get uh, delta sigma and delta pi will have an opposite sign. Or if the interaction is attractive, in attractive channel, then they will align. They will try to get aligned with each other. Right? So there's a storage force that is trying to align these two uh, phases of the order term. And this is just an equation for an oscillator. So if I hear this clock errors apart, I will induce oscillation. And if my storage force is weak, the oscillation is slow, so I have a low energy excitation. If the coupling is stronger, I will get a, I will get a fast oscillation, a high frequency oscillation. And now it's important actually when this oscillation is going to be in respect to the gap value, because if this frequency is lower than the smallest gap, I have a true collective mode, a delta function with no dissipation. If this is larger than the smallest gap, then of course things get way more complicated because there's a relaxation that I have to account for. 
Uh, now, what time excitation is this in the language of, so this is in language of uh, the phase in, in the, if I want to visualize that as a Cooper pass, what I'm doing here is this band structure, I'm just recording it, centering the gamma point is now here, so this is my uh, cylindrical band and this is my 3D band, and I'm trying to picture Cooper pair with k and minus k, and this Cooper pair is going to tunnel, this is an internal Josephson tunneling, uh, from one band to another. So the frequency of this tunneling gives that oscillation frequency. My total density in the sample, the Cooper pair density, is not changing. But the relative phase is oscillating because, because the Cooper pair is jumping from one. It's a Josephson, it's a typical Josephson effect, it's, a, it's an internal Josephson effect. So you don't need to make a junction, it happens between two bands of the same super. Okay? And this excitation, it turns out to be a Raman active excitation, and that can be detected by Raman scatter. And in MGV2, it turned out that, well, that's the feature. So there's a calculation that we did. This is the small gap, this is the large gap, and this is the strength of the interaction between the, between the two gaps. If, the, if we're talking about attractive interaction, if the interaction is weak, this mode is going to be a delta function, and it's, but that's the energy of that mode, and it's going to be inside the gap up to certain threshold interaction, beyond which, well, it's going to be a broad feature. But uh, to answer Peter's question, what this does is, if you properly calculate the Raman response function, it will steal all the spectra wave from that coherent spin, which should be if there is no interaction. If I turn it completely off, I have no that interaction. I would expect this to be here. The spectra wave is completely stolen, and we have this one. Right? And from the position of this mode, we can actually determine the interaction, it turns out to be uh, right on the money of the uh, calculation of LDA plus, plus correction by Bill Mazin and Corpus in 2001. So it's experimental verification that the interval interaction that it was kind of very important parameter in understanding all the business of MGB2, well, it was measured by this model and it turned out to be uh, completely correct. So it's, the observable was at 8 millivolt, and it completely renormalizes the response function. Therefore, if one would kind of analyze uh, some transport data, the expectation that we add up a radius at this energy and this energy is completely incorrect. Yeah, this is this is the cut, this is what the calculation showed, and this is the this is the feature was seen in that. Okay, uh, how much I have? Uh, seven minutes. Okay, let me let me let me go now. Uh, okay, turns out that our understanding of superconductors let's say, before 2001, uh, was naive. Because it's quite clear that all these materials are multiband superconductors. And the interaction between the bands cannot be ignored. And then we get all this physics of multiband. So if we go back to the very first data of Nairobi by Salamite, we have to account, oh, okay, I have this a very quick example, the tour of pictides that is well, definitely multiband. And there is a very clear prediction for multiband superconductors here. So uh, turns out that this is a calculation by Chukukov, Hirov, and Proshanov uh, that claims that if the other parameter is S plus S minus type, as was discussed many times this week, 
Then in the Raman spectroscopy, we should see a collective mode below the threshold in A1G symmetry. It's a very clear prediction. If it's S plus S plus, this mode get pushed in the continuum. We don't see. If it's S plus S minus, it's phase sensitive experiment. Uh, the mode collective mode should be below. Uh, unfortunately, I think the data is not. It's a small thing. The data is not as good yet to tell us that. On top of that, we see features that are similar. So this is Rudy Hutton's data. Uh, we see features similar to PyPC, where this is a pair signature of the node. And we don't see really much signal in A1G channel. Suddenly, in this data, there's no collective mode there. Uh, there's a similar data. Uh, from Sakuta's group uh, from Paris. Again, data consistent. We, we obtained uh, similar data as well. Uh, so far, we didn't find a sample that would show this clear signature of S plus mark. But the samples are an issue. Uh, now, just I want to mention about other things that can be done in Raman scan. We can do magnetic Raman scan. And in this case, what we do is, if we have anti-paramagnetic ordered system, uh, we can come in with a photon, kick out the photon in excited state, in excited state, move it around without being discovered you now, let that Feeling ground state to propagate, take the take the space of the hole and collapse that spin from above in the new position. And it's high probability exchange. So what we do is we are not flipping spin like Newton scattering does. We exchange usually neighboring space. And if it's a collinear stripe space like uh, Nikita's and we exchange this. Two spins, it will not cost us any energy, but if we exchange uh, these two spins or these two spins, uh, there is an energy price, and you see that in energy loss in spectroscopy, and we can measure, by doing that, we can measure the cost. And what's neat about this is, again, playing with different symmetries, just a polarization of light, relative to the crystallographic axis is because of this stripiness, well, remember that A versus B are almost the same, but the spin structure is very different <coughs> along A and B. And if we do the experiment in one geometry versus another geometry, we see clearly different features, but the symmetry allows us to do things very selectively, we can exchange these two spins. And this leads us to measure just in J1, J2 model, just measure J2 independently from J1. So we can measure S times J2 by seeing the energy of this spin. And it turns out to be 20 millivolts. Very different value from what neutron scattering suggests out of fit to the dispersion. Uh, we can, by doing fits, say what the J1 is, yes. Is that, uh, are you pointing out that that's supposed to be the two magnum peak? This is two magnum scatter. So, right. This is basically a single bound state of the right. yeah. The peak, as I recall, shouldn't occur at, at SJ, but something like 3SJ, right? Uh, for spin one half checkerboard for couplets. Okay. Yes, what happens is the 4J edge gets anomalous to 3J. Yes. Here we have completely different structure, and we have J1, J2 model. J2 turns out to be very important. J2 is stronger than J1. Yeah. J2 turns out to be twice of J2. So that Heisenberg checkerboard for a single J doesn't apply. And so you, it's a different analysis. Uh, but you can, yeah, you can. You can get, you can infer the different 
different shape. The position of this peak versus position of this peak tells where where the J1 is, and moreover, this is the end of two magnus at the edge. Half of that value tells where the end of the signal magnum dispersion is. Mm. It turns out that it's slightly higher than 100 millivolt. That is much lower than Newton scattering parameter tells. Now, if you look on the Newton scattering data, of course, the excitation, the high energy are highly lower than, and I suspect what they see is two triplet continuum. Uh, so this is, this should be the edge of the of the twice um, spin flip excitations. All right. Uh, should I stop here? Yes. Okay. Um, I have a comment and a question. First of all, the uh, collective mode in the S plus minus state, which is predicted by Chubukov et al., uh, one of the reasons it may not have been seen is that they neglected the backflow due to the Coulomb interaction. So this is uh, very strongly reduced. But it's probably... I, I, went, I, I, went, I went through that analysis. Yeah. Okay, so what they, they, they neglected it because they implied that they have whole and electron band with the same curvature exactly. opposite side and exactly. that console is... Right, so they have a very special case. They if you have a realistic case... Now, it turns out that uh, we followed it up and looked all the various cases and it turns out that this term is really not that important. It does not... But in any case where we have four electrons, these bands, we should see... We should see things. Should see something, yeah. And, I agree. and we, we almost don't. And there's an agreement. I don't see it. Rudy doesn't see it. Mm -hmm. Sakuta doesn't see it. Uh, it's also surprising that this signal is so strong. Because when I do calculation, I expect this signal, including the screen, I expect this signal being five times weaker than this. The screening doesn't couple to that channel. Well, there's no screening here. The screening is reducing ah. this. Yeah. After I screen that channel, I expect this, in, well, at least in my calculation, I expect this to be five times weaker than this. That's certainly not the case. So this is one, and this, this is a fraction. So we don't understand many things here. OK, maybe we can talk about the details. I have a question about the legged mode. Can you go back to your picture? Yeah. But I'm still confused about my earlier question. Oh, no. The one with the plot versus... It's yeah, that one. Okay. So if I go to zero coupling between the two bands, yes. why don't I get back the two delta peaks? You, two you will get the two delta peaks. But I don't see them. Uh, it's not... It's the zero coupling is not plotted here. It's just... Plotting differently. The axis is zero. Huh? The axis yeah, is yeah, zero. Yeah, yeah, Okay. So it, the way this plot is constructed, it's not considering that case. But once you get this mode, this basically is all screened and taken spectrally. So, and that's that's essence of that Miles Klein's, the second big paper that came out in 2010. So the point, the main point of that is that A, the intensity is not being screened completely, there is intensity remains, and that intensity is not into the collective mode. And well, that's very important. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I just don't see it on your plot. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> this, this is simplified. Okay. It, it, it was, it, this cartoon is, was meant to show what happens here, not in that limit. Okay. In that limit, you will see screen feature here, you will see screen feature. Yes. Way at the beginning, you mentioned that you thought the uh, the CDW superconductivity uh, collective mode thing was unresolved. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, that's uh, that's another part of the talk that I don't have. Uh, but let's let's take more questions and maybe <laughs> maybe maybe again.
Yeah, that's a different expectation. That's essentially the model of Anderson. And that does get the charge system pushed out to plasma frequencies. Yeah. Because in a sense, uh, not related to the solar system, but in a sense, the Anderson system is also the model of Anderson. So if there is a really realized some materials. Do you think that Raman will be uh, sensitive? I mean, to, uh, it will be a good probe to study them. Well, uh, it's, a, it's a very general question. I, uh, so let's let's break it up. For instance, if there are time runners of Raman, right, mm -hmm. then um, a Raman is good probe to check time runners of Symmetry by looking excitation in A to G channel. So there's no excitation in A to G channel unless you have S dot S cross S type pairs. Right? So time reversal. Broke the time reversal symmetry. So that was applied to Cooper if people who worked hard for time reversal. Broken symmetry. And that uh, that's one thing that comes to mind. That would be, that would be interesting to look at. Um, it's, it's very dull. If those are really only surface states, I do it it's oh, difficult yeah. to pass on. Yeah. It's not an avoidance. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought about it. How would we create it? I didn't understand the number that you get of you and you. Do you find an event? Uh, no, so uh, I believe that what we have here is a case where, I don't know, it's one of the, one of the, one of the species is on. So from the Raman data board, what I will conclude is that only York can do that. <laughs>
Has anybody ever seen a Bardesi Shreefer mode? Um. Probably not. At some point, this collective mode that we saw, we were trying to interpret something. You, you can, it's an alternative interpretation to, to that paper that I referred to. You can think about this excitation in, in high DC inside that gap that you have a D wave ground state and then you have failed on the parameter and S channel. Mm -hmm. So the difference is D1G. And the excitation is basically a spectroscopic excitation into that failed on the parameter. So the symmetry is correct, the signature is correct. But Might be. But that's usually interpreted as a broadened to delta mode, right? No, no, but remember it's again V wave, so this, yeah. this, this will be important. Yeah, no, I understand, but it's not usually assumed. If, put it this way, the theory that's used to describe that data does not have an S wave component at all. No, so no, there should that, be no, that, there that, should no, be no uh, if you refer to that paper, no. Yeah. But you can, you, can, you can build up an in, in alternative, alternative theory, right? You say you include S wave, and people have done that, right? So there are calculations. And there are estimates how much binding you get from an S channel. Uh, and they are not that much off. Hmm. Okay. But I don't. They, come, they, they don't come out from spectrometer with labels. You know, they're peaks, but they don't tell. <laughs> I'm going to be Here's actually temperature dependence of this to magnum feature, it goes away completely at here. So as soon as you cross here, it's done. So it's a three-dimensional. Yes. This published yet? This one, no. OK, thank you. It's OK, we got it on camera. No, <laughs> <laughs> no other questions? Thank you very much. OK. Thank you.